Welcome to the Critical Hour. We're coming to you from the capital of the United States of America, Washington, D.C., here on Radio Sputnik. I'm your host, political scientist, author, and nationally syndicated columnist, Dr. Wilmer Leon. I'm joined here by my co-host, political analyst, Garland Nixon. Thank you, Wilmer. For the next two hours, we will explore and analyze the salient news stories that are impacting the global village in which we live. George Galloway's blowout victory has shocked the British elite. Joining us now to discuss this and more, we have Dr. Gerald Horn. He's a professor of history at the University of Houston, Texas. He's an author, historian, and a researcher. Dr. Horn, welcome back to Critical Hour. Thank you for inviting me. The UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak stated... Quote, we are a country where we love our neighbors and we're building Britain together. But I fear that our great achievement in building the world's most successful multi-ethnic, multi-faith democracy is being deliberately undermined, Dr. Horn. Apparently it's being de- under, a bit deliberately undermined by democracy and the choice of the voters. Your thoughts? Well, it's obvious why Prime Minister Sunak is concerned because the victory of George Galloway basically presages a victory for Mr. Sunak and his Tory party in upcoming elections. The victory of George Galloway is also, in a sense, a repudiation of what befell former Labor Party leader Jeremy Corbyn, who was hounded out of leadership of the Labor Party on spurious and specious charges of being anti-Jewish. Actually, the real charge was that he was pro-Palestinian, like George Galloway. Similarly, it's interesting that Sir Kerr Storm, who replaced Jeremy Corbyn, is in many ways a kind of pale imitation of Rishi Sunak, and it's unclear whether or not that will be enough to carry him into office at 10 Downing Street, that is to say replacing Uh, Rishi Sunak in this upcoming election. I should also mention parenthetically that uh, Mr. Starmer, or Sir Kerr, excuse me, uh, has a very interesting political background. Like Lionel Jospin, the former leader of the Socialist Party in France, uh, Sir Kerr also has a political background involved with uh, so-called Trotskyist forces, who at one time were influential to a certain degree, uh, in London. But I think to step back and look at what's happening in London, we have to put it in a wider context, the wider context being the disarray engendered by the impending defeat of this Ukrainian caper, uh, which has exposed the leaders of the various North Atlantic countries and not for their betterment. You see a signal of that in the Michigan primary, Uh, just a few days ago, were uncommitted, uh, won 13-plus percent of the vote. 5% was thought to be tremendous. 13% is spectacular. A signal to Mr. Biden, which apparently he heard because the news today is that Vice President Harris has now come out for a ceasefire, uh, believe it or not. Uh, In some ways, uh, she's now the stalking horse for a change in political position by the White House. But you also see it uh, in Texas, where the reigning Republican Party is involved in bloodletting. It's referred to as a Texas civil war with the attorney general recently acquitted for impeachment charges for various misdeeds, now going after the Republican speaker of the legislature uh, in Austin. And you also see it in the state of Washington, where seeking to emulate Michigan, you see that the labor movement has called for a vote for uncommitted with regard to the Democratic primary. And you also see it in Israel. Uh, You may have noticed the story that Benny Gantz, a competitor for Mr. Netanyahu to be prime minister in Israel, is now visiting Washington, D.C. to the consternation of Mr. Netanyahu, of putting pressure on Mr. Netanyahu with regard to Mr. Biden's electoral chances in terms of effectuating a ceasefire, which would be contrary to the interests of Mr. Netanyahu, who wants to see this war 
continue indefinitely, saving him from perhaps going to prison or even being dislodged in a palace coup or in an election, but in a certain sense, turnabout is fair play, because recall that during the Obama years, Mr. Netanyahu accepted an invitation, not from the White House, but from the GOP, to come address Congress in opposition to Mr. Netanyahu, uh, to, excuse me, in opposition to Mr. Uh, Obama's uh, Iranian policy. And of course, you, you see this disarray in France, where President Macron has been attacked from right and from left, from suggesting that uh, France and NATO should commit boots on the ground to the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, you see it in Italy, where Prime Minister Net Maloney, uh, who of course comes from a neo-fascist background, is uh, under assault because of her standing along with NATO concerning this Ukrainian caper. You see it in the Federal Republic of Germany, where Chancellor Schultz is in trouble. Uh, he may fall victim to a palace coup effectuated by his defense minister, Boris Pistorius. And of course, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, the head of the European Commission, who is also German, is under assault uh, from right and from left because of her standing by uh, Mr. Netanyahu uh, steadfastly. And you even see it in Canada, the northern neighbor of the United States, where Prime Minister Trudeau is going through tough times, and he may be challenged from the left uh, by the NDP, the New Democratic Party, under the leadership of Jack McSinn. You see it in Japan, where the ruling Liberal Democratic Party is a scandal written and may be falling victim to electoral defeat as a result. And of course, back to London, you see that the fact that Mr. Sunak is in such hot water is betokened by the fact that there has been loose talk of the clown prince of British politics, Boris Johnson, returning to 10 Downing Street, if not the recently appointed foreign minister, David Cameron, who of course fell victim to Brexit uh, some uh, eight odd years ago in 2016. But to a certain extent, uh, all of this disarray in the North Atlantic camp and in Japan is a kind of rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic before it goes down. Uh, that is to say, it's a reflection of instability and crisis in these capitalist countries that will be difficult to reverse. It's symptomatic of Copernican changes taking place in the global political economy signaling the demise of the group of seven led by the United States and with its comical sidekicks in Western Europe and Japan. And of course, the rise of the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, uh, plus the uh, five, Saudi Arabia, Iran, UAE, Egypt, and Ethiopia, uh, who have a gross domestic product or an economy already uh, probably larger than that but by a purchasing power parity than the group of seven. So these countries that have been ruling over planet Earth for centuries to the detriment of this small planet are now in for a bitter, and I'm afraid to say, upsetting defeat. And these changes that you see in the politics are just a reflection of that. And Sunak went on to say there are forces here at home trying to tear us apart. Since October 7th, there have been those trying to take advantage of the very human angst that we all feel about the terrible suffering that war brings to the innocent. Nearly everyone in Britain supports these basic values. There are small and vocal hostile groups who do not. Islamist extremists and the far right feed off and embolden each other. A lot of that language sounds very similar to what's coming from from Democrats here. Um, and and we know that that's a horrific misrepresentation of reality. Your thoughts, Dr. Horn? Well, let's face it. London is in a real corner right now, as is the European Union as a whole. Uh, that is to say that with Mr. Trump, trying to pull the rug out from under NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, I think that what Mr. Trump is trying to do is gain leverage over the EU and make evident and obvious what is apparent. That is to say that these leading capitalist countries are no more 
than vassals of U.S. imperialism that standing alone, they're not able to confront the potent Russia-China BRICS bloc, and they need U.S. imperialism if they are to have a ghost of a chance of doing so. And so as a result of this precipitous fall in potency by London and by the European Union uh, in a, a manner that they hardly recognize, because after all, they're enmeshed in false consciousness, uh, this leads to the kind of harebrained remarks you just attributed to uh, Mr. Sunak. And it also, as I suggested, helps to bespeak a looming political catastrophe for his own Tory party. Dr. Horn, uh, Naked Capitalism has an interesting article. Democratic rights are no excuse for airing Russian perspectives in Europe. And basically what they get into is that it's a great article. Uh, uh, but what they get into is everything that happens in Europe. No, but, you know, it, it, the people push back, the people scream, the people vote out someone that they, they don't like. And the ruling elite at every instance says it's Russia, misinformation, information operation, whatever the case may be. Dr. Horn. It's deja vu all over again. What I mean is, is that those of a certain age recall that during the anti-Jim Crow movement, our opponents suggested that we were all dupes of Moscow, that we were all being manipulated by so-called outside agitators. And to a certain degree, what you see with regard to pointing the finger at so-called purported alleged Russian disinformation It's an equivalent of the thief yelling, stop thief, in other words, trying to distract attention from their own misdeeds by pointing the finger at someone else. And, of course, the credibility of these sources is plummeting with every passing day. Your audience, I'm sure, is familiar with the debunked story in The New York Times of a few months ago suggesting that Hamas was involved in sexual predation on October 7th. The Intercept, Electronic Intifada, uh, the Gray Zone, amongst others, have poked holes in that spurious story. If you look at the Voice of America, the official media arm of Washington, the U.S. government, you see that their South African correspondent is violently hostile to the ruling African National Congress, a member in good standing of the aforementioned BRICS, and in fact is a stalwart supporter of the neo-apartheid Democratic Alliance, And this correspondent also writes for the hysterically anti-communist and pro-GOP epic times, which, of course, you wonder about that because they also support Mr. Trump, Mr. Biden's opponent. And you wonder why is a Biden voice of America helping to bolster a Trump reporter in Johannesburg? This is a reflection of the crisis of the corporate media. Uh, That is to say, they're losing altitude with every passing day with regard to the Facebook and Google uh, gobbling up uh, their advertising, with regard to their distribution model basically undermined by the Internet. This has led to layoffs at the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post. Will CNN survive to the end of the decade is an open question. We already know that they're talking about cutting the spectacularly high salaries of their anchors like Wolf Blitzer and Anderson Cooper, uh, perhaps uh, dragging them down to uh, rather, uh, well, I won't say Sputnik levels, but certainly dragging them down. But in any case, it also reflects the contradictions of this corporate media. For example, if you look at the New York Post, uh, controlled by Australian-American billionaire uh, Rupert Murdoch, who also controls Fox News, they, of course, are supposed to be a symbol of family values, But if you want to see, and uh, and I say this uh, with all seriousness and uh, with a certain amount of modesty, if you want to see soft porn, turn to the New York Post. That is to say that on the one hand, on the one side of their mouth, they're talking about family values. On the other side of their mouth, they're engaging in objectification of women uh, helping to undermine a family values. And the cherry on top of the cake is the recent story in the Washington Post that Facebook aligned with the Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith, a member in good standing of the Zionist Project, is considering saying that use of the term Zionism in a negative context is hate speech. So 
I'm not sure where this is heading, but certainly it does not bode well with the future viability of the North Atlantic bloc and their minions, the corporate media. Dr. Gerald Horn is a professor of history at the University of Houston in Texas. He's an author, historian, and researcher. You're listening to the